Hi everybody, my name is Jen Wei Tate and I'm a research associate at the Biofrontiers Institute at the University of Colorado Boulder. In this talk, I'd like to tell you about some of the work I've been doing in the Cameron Lab, where we've been using optical microscopy and computational analysis to study photosynthesis in single cyanobacterial cells. Now to carry out photosynthesis experiments, we need to know how much light each cell receives. In conventional bulk culturing conditions, cells are exposed to a dynamic light environment that depends on the mixing of the sample as well as the density of the culture. In dense cultures, cell-to-cell -cell shading becomes a problem as light becomes attenuated the further it travels into the sample. Now this can lead to heterogeneities in cell responses. For example, cells closest to the light would grow faster, as indicated by the yellow line here, uh, while cells further away from the light would grow more slowly, as indicated by the green line. Now this heterogeneity in cell response will cause challenges in ensemble-based measurements, since there is no way to tell these different phenotypes apart. So to overcome this problem, we have developed a way to grow and film cells using long-term time-lapse microscopy. The picture on the right shows our microscope in the lab, and the cartoon on the left shows the schematic of its components. Let's start by taking a look at the sample first. So to overcome issues such as cell-cell shading, we grow cells in a two-dimensional layer on an agar pad. Now this agar pad is placed within an imaging dish, um, which, which is shown in this photo here on the left. Um, now this imaging dish is then placed onto the microscope. And I'd just like to uh, you know, point out here that our microscope has two different sources of light. Um, the top lamp here creates a wide but less intense beam that we use to grow the cyanobacteria. And this lamp at the bottom here uh, is much more intense uh, and is focused through the objective lens um, onto the sample uh, to excite fluorescence. And then the emitted fluorescence travels back through this objective um, and back through the same path and gets imaged onto a camera. Now cyanobacteria are very interesting to image because they basically they exhibit autofluorescence. Now when light gets absorbed, the PS2 complex enters an energetically excited state. And this energy will be transferred either into the electron transport chain or it will be released as a photon generating fluorescence. The intensity of PS2 fluorescence provides a readout of the cell's ability to carry out photosynthesis. So if the plastoquinoline pool and the electron transport chain are open and ready to accept electrons, then the light energy gets transferred down to photochemistry and the level of fluorescence is low. However, if the chain is backed up for some reason, then most of the energy will be emitted as fluorescence instead and we get high fluorescence. Uh, so optical microscopy gives us an almost real-time readout of the photosynthetic state of the cell. Now, cyanobacteria also possess light harvesting antenna called phycobilosomes. And under, light, uh, under normal light conditions, the phycobilosome is attached to PS2 um, and basically the phycobilosomes will absorb light and transfer energy down to the PS2 complex. Uh, when, the, when the antenna are coupled, um, the fluorescence is emitted mainly from the PS2 complexes themselves um, and the light is at approximately 685 nanometers. However, cyanobacteria can regulate the photosynthetic process. So under highlight competitions, for example, uh, the phycobilosome can be detached. And in this case, the fluorescence is emitted from the phycobilosome complexes themselves. Um, and the wavelength is slightly uh, different. It's at 665 nanometers. Now with optical microscopy, we have control over both the excitation and emission wavelength. So we can basically observe the fluorescence on each of these components separately. So here are examples of images that we collect on the microscope. On the left are bright field image, um, which is basically formed by the light that is transmitted through the sample. Um, and as I'll explain on the next slide, we use these bright field images to identify cells in the image. Uh, this middle image here was collected using the Psi 5 filter set. And this filter set has a long pass uh, red emission filter, which basically lets through uh, mainly chlorophyll fluorescence. Now finally, we will acquire images using the RFP filter set, which transmits mainly phycobilosome fluorescence. And I just wanted to point out here that for all the fluorescence images that you will see in this talk, I've chosen to use the plasma color palette, which is indicated here. So dim intensities will appear as black or purple, and high intensities will appear as yellow. To analyze these images, I have developed computational toolboxes that allows us to identify individual cells in the image as well as track them over time. And this approach allows us to study the response of a single cell.
Now I don't have time to go through the entire image analysis pipeline, but we have written up the technique and it's currently available as a preprint on by archive. So let me just show you the results. Uh, the image here is a bright field image. And the image on the right here is the mask that was generated by the segmentation algorithm. So basically in the mask, every pixel um, that belongs to uh, a cell is labeled as true or appears white in this mask. Now the blue numbers here are assigned to each cell by the tracking code. And what you'll see as I play the movie is that basically each cell will keep its unique ID until it divides. And then once it divides, um, each daughter cell gets assigned a new ID. Um, and we use these IDs to basically keep track of the mother-daughter relationships as the cells divide. So using our image analysis code, we can measure many different properties of cells. So for example, we can measure the length of a cell over time. And once we have that data, we can then fit it to an exponential curve um, and measure the growth rate. As I mentioned earlier, we can also monitor chlorophyll fluorescence over time and get a readout of the, photosynth uh, the photosynthetic state of the cell. And finally, we can also fluorescently label different components of the cell, such as chromosomes. And these will typically appear as small spots within the cell itself. And our code allows us to count and also monitor the position of these spots within each cell. Now, if you remember, the tracking code assigns an ID to each cell, as well as keeping track of the mother-daughter relationships. So with that information, we can basically uh, generate a tree plot like this, which shows the lineage of a cell. So this example here is of, a, of this colony here, um, which shows the first two divisions in the colony. Um, and the horizontal lines in the lineage tree here indicates the length of time that a cell exists before it divides. And then each of these splits here um, indicates a division event. Now this type of tree is also known as a binary tree in computer science. And there are actually a lot of algorithms out there to traverse and search for data using these trees. Um, so I've implemented some of the traversal algorithms so we can basically pull out data belonging to a single colony. So for example, here I've pulled out basically just the length of a time uh, for these cells here. Now this is actually pretty exciting as we can now analyze information either in absolute time, in, in minutes, or hours, um, or we can bin them by generation. And we're just getting started on this, but this approach has allowed us to study how traits or cell components are inherited through different generations. Um, and our data also allows us to look at um, at different organizational scales. So for example, we can also look at data from just in single cells, or we can look at data between individual colonies. Uh, so there's clearly a lot that we can do with microscopy and image analysis. Uh, so what I've been doing is uh, using this system to study photo inhibition in cyanobacterial cells. Now it turns out that the PS2 complex in cyanobacteria are constantly being damaged as they absorb light. Uh, so basically to maintain a population of functional PS2, the cell has to continuously repair the damaged components. And this uh, damage repair cycle is briefly illustrated in this cartoon here. Now the rate of photo damage is dependent on the amount of light that is absorbed. So as long as the cell isn't exposed to too much light, then it is able to repair its damage and maintain some steady state population of functional PS2. However, however if the cell is exposed to too much light, such that um, the rate of photo damage is much greater than the rate of repair, then excuse me, most of the PS2 complexes will then become damaged and the cell will no longer be able to grow. And this condition is known as photo inhibition. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the advantage of our system is that we can grow cells in a single layer, which means that we can expose the cells to a controlled burst of light and induce photo inhibition, but hopefully not outright cell death. So as a proof of principle, I wanted to look at the response of a wild-type cyanobacterial cell compared to a photosynthetic mutant. Uh, so the, se the cell I'm using is the Cyanococcus species PCC7002. And in the Cameron lab, we have a strain of mutants which have the phycobilosome knocked, uh, knocked out. And I will refer to these as Delta CPC or Delta CPCB for short. Uh, so Basically, um, my experimental protocol starts with me growing the cells in liquid culture. Um, and then I mix the two different strains together and then spot them onto a half percent agar um, imaging pad. The, the agar pad is then placed into an imaging dish and I then lift, leave the dish um, on the microscope with the growth light and the heating chamber on for about 30 minutes to let the cells acclimatize. The cells are then imaged every 30 minutes for 10 hours which allows us to observe the first few cell doublings. 
uh, the cells are then exposed to an amount of blue light, uh, about 440 nanometers induced for the damage. And then they were imaged for another 22 hours to see if they would recover. Now this whole experiment was basically programmed in the microscope, so all I had to do is basically click the run button. Now with the microscope, we can image multiple different locations on the agar pad in the same experiment. Uh, so what I did was to basically program uh, the microscope to look at 35 different locations on the agar pad. Um, and basically for each of these spots, the cells were exposed to a different amount and intensity of uh, irradiating light. So I basically organized this in a grid pattern and with increasing intensity along the horizontal axis and increasing light duration um, along the vertical axis. Uh, so I'm going to describe the results that we have for three different representative conditions. Uh, the first is the low light case where the cells were illuminated for half a second at 5% laser power, um, which corresponds to about 11 milliwatts. And again, this, we're using blue light here. Uh, in the second case, uh, which I'm going to call the highlight case, cells were irradiated for two seconds at 85% laser power, which corresponds to about 196 milliwatts. And then finally, um, in the saturating case, cells were exposed for two seconds at 25% laser power, which corresponds to about 57 milliwatts. Uh, so here are some representative images uh, showing what these cells look like under the microscope. And you'll see that basically we have two populations of cells here. Um, the smaller cells here are the delta CTC cells, and then these larger cells here are the wild type cells. Um, you'll notice that in the fluorescence channels that the delta CTC cells always look um, a little bit dimmer than the wild type cells. Um, this is obviously uh, most apparent in the phycobilism channel um, where these cells are very, very dim due to the fact that they no longer have the phycobilism rods. All right, so I'm going to show you now a video of the cells in the low light condition. So uh, here, I'd just like to draw your attention here. So we have a um, delta CTC cell down here and we have a wild type cell up here. Uh, and same in, the, in all the different fluorescence channels as well. So I'm just gonna play the movie and the cells get irradiated about here. And as you can see, they basically just keep growing. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out here is if you look at this wild type colony here, um, as by the end of the movie, the wild type colony gets very, very large and you can see from the bright field image that these cells are basically growing on top of each other. Uh, so our computational toolboxes cannot track the cells once the colonies grow this large. So we typically will stop tracking the wild type cells uh, before the delta CTC cells. The delta CPC cells here grow about twice as slowly. So this is less of a problem for these colonies. Uh, so to analyze the cells, um, I wrote some code to identify the wild type and delta CPC cells based on the phycobilism fluorescence. Um, and once we do that, I can basically uh, bin the data into two, two different groups. Um, and these are two representative plots of um, two different colonies that we can see. Uh, so this top plot here shows a lineage tree for a wild type colony. And you can see that this dotted line here indicates the irradiation event. And you can see that um, the cells continue to grow um, and they don't seem to be perturbed by the irradiation at all, they just continue to divide. And the same thing happens here for the delta CPC cells as well. All right, let's see what happens when we illuminate the cells with more light. Uh, so again, here you can tell from the fluorescence channel that these two cells are the delta CPC cells, and these two here are the wild type cells. So let me play the video. Cells get blasted with light. And you'll notice that they basically get bright and then they go dim. So let me um, play that video one more time. Now, one thing I like to point out here is that you'll you'll notice that basically once the cells are irradiated with the blue light, um, they all stop growing. So here are the lineage uh, trees for both uh, wild type and delta CPC cells, and you can see that you know after irradiation, the cells are no longer growing. Um, and what's really interesting here is that we see that the cells get bright first in the chlorophyll channel and then they get dim, and then they get bright in the phycobilism channel a few hours later. Uh, so this is consistent with some of our other experiments in the lab. And what I think is happening here is that the chlorophyll uh, becomes damaged first. So then they start to fluoresce and then they bleach. Um, and then eventually the phycobilisms will detach and then they start to fluoresce. Okay, so 
let me show you now the the condition with the saturating irradiation. And again, uh, these ones here are the wild type cells, and these ones here are the delta CPC cells. Okay, let me play this video again because I think that there are some interesting phenotypes to point out. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to draw your attention to this wild type colony here. So you'll see if I play as I play the movie, the cells get blasted with light, and you can see that these three sister cells here stop growing, but this sister um, seems to continue to prol proliferate, which is interesting. Um, next, if you look at this cell here, which is a delta CPC cell, you'll see that after the cells are exposed to light, little bright puncta forms and then seems to migrate to one of the edge of the cell. Um, and what I think is happening there is that basically um, that spot is some sort of uh, repair mechanism or recycling mechanism. Um, and yeah, that's basically what that is indicating. Uh, so here are the lineage plots for representative colonies in that movie. So for the wild type cells, um, you can see that was the colony that I showed you earlier. Um, so basically after irradiation, uh, three of the sisters, A, B, and C, stop growing, and they glow bright in the phycobilism channel at the end of the movie. Um, but this sister here, D, seems to be fine. It doesn't seem to be affected at all and just continues to divide. Uh, and the same thing here occurs uh, for the delta CPC cells as well. We see examples of this asymmetric survival where one sister is fine and continues to grow and one sister um, seems to have stopped growing. So I feel like this data is currently, you know, has a lot more questions than answers for me. Uh, one of the big questions I'm trying to tackle right now is to figure out why some cells seem to recover from the irradiation event, but some do not. Uh, so microscope uh, images, we can gather a lot of data about the cell, including the cell length and the chlorophyll fluorescence. But we can also gather contextual information, like where the cell is in its growth cycle. So, the, you know, for example, does the cell um, just divide, or is it about to enter a division? Um, so I'm still analyzing the data, and I'm, what I'm trying to do is to see if there's a trait or a combination of traits that will allow me to predict whether a cell will survive or die after irradiation. Some other questions I'm trying to look at is to figure out which proteins or pathways are most important for photo protection. And finally, I'm also trying to see whether I can train a machine learning algorithm to uh, recognize these phenotypes and predict the cell fate. So with that, I'd like to conclude uh, this talk. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge all the funding agencies, um, as well as the Cameron Lab, and in particular, uh, Dr. Kristen Moore, Nick Hill, and Professor Jeff Cameron. Uh, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please email me at jen.tay at colorado.edu. Thanks.